Um, today, if you are here and you're a member, you can um, buy tickets for a special sneak preview of the Dome. Um, the Dome is here. Uh, and if you um, are here as a guest today and you want to um, turn in your ticket and upgrade to a membership, you can also um, get a Dome ticket. So just FYI in case you're interested um, in seeing the Dome. And then, of course, um, you can visit our website, thedali.org, to find out all about the amazing programs that we have, um, you know, amazing um, lectures like the one that we're about to hear, workshops, um, dancing, food, drink. Um, we really try to hit all of the aspects. So a few things we're doing this month. Um, we're going to have tomorrow, actually, Surrealist Game Night. And I believe there's just a few tickets left for that. That's going to be a lot of fun. And that's going to be led by my amazing colleague, um, Joy. Then on Sunday, for the little ones, we're going to have the Little Surrealist Tour and Dilly Dally with Dolly um, Art Experience. We have a members-only event on Friday the 11th, um, Paperscapes, where we're going to be um, displaying paper-based art. And then um, on Sunday the 13th, uh, baseball fans, any baseball fans in here? Woo! OK, we're going to have the Dolly Museum Day at Tropicana Field. Um, and so you're able to go get special seating and a really cool um, commemorative um, Dolly baseball that's decorated with one of Dolly's drawings from Destino. Um, on Thursday the 17th, uh, we have baseball fans. Do we have DJ fans? People who want to come in and listen to some music? Yeah, absolutely. We're going to have our Surreal Summer Nights um, at the Dali, and this is going to be supported this month by Shine Mural Festival. Um, in addition to a DJ, DJ Repeat, who's going to be here um, spinning some tunes for us, we're also going to have um, artist Ashley Quintero, who is going to be live painting um, a custom mural design that she made um, for the museum. And there are going to be some um, black and white paper copies so that if you want to color along with her, um, or do your own version. Um, it'll be a lot of fun. And then um, Sunday the 20th, we have Yoga at the Dali. Um, and then for the little ones, story time and Dilly Dally. And then we're going to be ending the month um, with the podcast um, that I do, Follow the Tangent. If you've never seen it, you can catch it up on YouTube um, or on Facebook. And this month, it will be with Shana, and we're doing our yearly mailbag edition. So if you have any burning questions about Dali, about the collection, about the Morses, um, about any aspect of the Dalinian world, um, you can send those to info at the Dali.org. And that is for people who are here in the audience and of course our audience on YouTube, info at the Dali.org. And finally, be sure to join us um, next month for our Coffee with the Curator, which is going to be with um, Leslie Elsasser from um, USF. And she's going to be talking about um, a really important topic, arts and medicine, um, specifically creating a wellness model, um, using it as an example, um, the wellness model that they've created for the veteran community and their families. Um, USF does really amazing work around arts and wellness, and she'll be sharing some of that with us. So be sure to check it out. Now, it is my immense pleasure to be able to introduce um, our guest speaker, Sonia Jordan Mowry. She is the co-owner of Maori Book and Paper Conservation, which is located in Venice, Florida. And she has come all this way to be with us, and we appreciate that. She has a master's in philosophy, a master's in rare books and manuscripts, and received her conservation training both in the United States and in Europe. She is a professional associate of the American Institute of Conservation, a member of the International Institute for conservation and served for eight years for the American Library Associate as the US Delegate for Conservation to the International Federation of Library Associations. She has been a bench conservator and the head of several conservation programs since 1990, when she established the first conservation program at the University of Notre Dame in Indiana. In 2003, became the Rizika Feldman Director of Conservation at the University Libraries of Johns Hopkins University and while there in 2009, with support from the Andrew Mellon Foundation, established Heritage Science for Conservation at Johns Hopkins. In addition to her work as a conservator, Sonia has published in the field of conservation and preservation, has an extensive track record of successful grant writing from the National Endowment for the Humanities, Institute for Museums and Library Science, the Culpepper Foundation, the Andrew Mellon Foundation, as well as others. 
She has conducted conservation assessments for libraries, archives, museums, and historical societies in the US and for major libraries in Europe, Africa, and South America. In 2015, she retired, retired, to Venice, <laughs> where she and her husband opened, uh, like many people I know, I think she failed retirement. <laughs> and opened their conservation studio and continued to provide conservation services to private clients as well as cultural institutions in Florida and across the United States. Please join me in welcoming Sonia. Thank you. Yes, I'm still waiting for retirement. Uh, I'm a short person, so I have to move the microphone. Can you hear me? Yes? OK, great, wonderful. A testimony to your excellent audiovisual facilities here. Well, I'm delighted to be here, needless to say, although I'm less happy about being on YouTube. If I still look like that, I guess my feelings would be somewhat different. But that was many years ago. And if I could preserve myself like that, I would, I'm sure, uh, be able to make a mint uh, in the market. But c'est la vie. Um, today, it's my pleasure to talk about the topic of preserving the past through the eyes of, a, of conservation, which is a large component, not the only component, but a large component that can help guarantee that the things that have been created by human endeavor um, do, do not get lost, do not get damaged, that are, they are there for the future. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about. I've tried to keep the language of the presentation accessible without too much jargon. Um, but hopefully you will be able to follow that. I do use some terms. Uh, and of course, this is simply the role uh, of conservator in the realm of paper materials. So here we go. So this is a picture of me on the left working on a paper document and on the right working on a palm leaf manuscript. And there are a number of uh, materials that paper conservators work on. I'm technically a book and paper conservator. There's a lot of similarities. Obviously, books are made out of paper, but they also have a three-dimensionality and they function. So they have mechanical performance issues that also have to be addressed, whereas a flat piece of paper has different but similar problems. So what is the role of conservation? I'm not going to read everything. I will summarize, but please take the time to read it because it's there for you. So conservation basically covers a variety of actions which are intended to stabilize and or repair an artifact uh, so it may be preserved and appreciated for the future generations. These actions include things like examination. We often call that condition assessment, same action. Documentation, we're obligated by our professional field to document both in written form and in photographic uh, form what it is that we see so we can justify our descriptions and our protocols for eventual action. Treatment is referred to as the actual acts we take to perform improvement, stabilization, repair. And then, of course, recommending a course of action so whatever the damage is, it doesn't happen again. Obviously, there's no point in fixing something. Uh, and getting it back to as close a state as possible as when it was originally created, only to have it run through that course again. Much of the work that the conservator has uh, done has been established by long-term experience and the lessons learned from what we call the natural aging of materials, which tells us a lot about the inherent characteristics of these materials. And then, of course, there are the external factors, things that are done by other actions like the environment, et cetera. But more significantly, the field of heritage science conservation, which is a relatively recent phenomenon for book and paper, I would say that the organization of this discipline has been profoundly growing uh, in the last 20 years. They continue to advance methods for examination and analysis of materials that further our understanding of the process of degradation. But the role of conservation is only one part of the effort in preserving the past for the future. Conservation requires collaboration. I mentioned to you heritage science for conservation. This is a very specialized 
specialized field, which has really come into its own, as I said, in the last 20 years. This is where scientists work with conservators. Uh, at Hopkins, they were actually in the conservation lab. Up until that period, uh, other than the Library of Congress and major national uh, libraries, uh, scientists work in their areas of specialty, and then we would ask them to do perhaps a research project for us. They'd finish it, and then they'd go off and do their own thing, and we didn't have the continuity of studying things for any long period of time because they were project-oriented. There wasn't a discipline specifically dedicated to this field. But with conservators now working with scientists, they're able to study causes of deterioration so that we can find remedies, and they're dedicated to this field of research. They also develop equipment and techniques for conservators to use so they can take their scientific expertise, look at a problem, say, oh, we need to develop a different piece of equipment to do X, or there's a piece of equipment in another discipline that could really be useful in this regard. And then, of course, the most important thing is that they publish their findings so we conservators can be informed, and we, in turn, convey the information to institutions who are responsible for the care of those collections. So here you see basically the conservation lab that I had at Hopkins, uh, my two scientists on the left, a conservator and a scientist. This was the conference that the Andrew Mellon Foundation um, funded. Uh, there were about 30 uh, individuals representing the sciences, uh, the Library of Congress, uh, the National Archives, the Walters Art Museum, um, curators, scientists, conservators, and on the bottom right is, of course, the language of science, which, you know, looks like someone from the fifth grade just drew a diagram, right? <laughs> but it actually means something. I recall that conversation had to do with paper and the ability when paper gets brittle, it can't make that nice turn, that draping. So we were trying to analyze what's going on when it becomes brittle that it can't arc, it can't be flexible. And that was the mathematical equation for doing that. So in addition to science, we collaborate with cultural institutions like the Dali, like St. Pete's, and a number of others. Um, preserving works of art does not begin with conservation, but with preservation. Obviously, conservation enters the scene after the damage has already been done. Preservation measures are the key to preserving our artifacts, and they should begin from the moment of acquisition, whether it's an individual acquiring an artifact or an institution, through the life of the work. For institutions in particular, such as this one and many others, cultural institutions, preservation is the collaborative responsibility among curators, registrars, building facilities, engineers, architects, and the administrative offices, obviously, who provide the resources needed to support the efforts. Without them, nothing can really happen, except through donations, and we want to institutionalize our preservation, not make it haphazard. The role of conservation is to share our knowledge and expertise so these efforts can be made. So what then do we do? What's our side of the responsibility? And as I mentioned, there are basically three. One is to assess the condition, the examination stage. And this requires looking at the primary support. And what the primary support basically means is the th uh, the the substance on which the art has been made, right? In this case, we're talking about paper. But there are many substrates, many primary supports that still fall under the umbrella of a paper conservator's responsibility. So one is identify the primary support, the media, what materials were used to inscribe uh, uh, the information, the nature and the cause of damage, that's one. We recommend preventative actions. We propose treatments which will either correct, reverse, arrest, or stabilize. All those are options. Sometimes we can reverse something. Sometimes we have to just stabilize it. Sometimes nothing can, more can be done because it's too far gone. We can digitize it, which is basically how the life of digitization uh, initiated. The other thing we do is obviously the conservation treatment itself. And these are executing best treatment options that will physically stabilize the artifact 
as well as identifying the limits of those treatments, because sometimes a deterioration could have gone so far that to do anything riskier may sacrifice it. Sometimes you have competing elements in an artifact that to solve one problem, you might create another. So we have to identify the limits and our knowledge of something may be limited or our ability to do what is we want to do, the science isn't there yet. So there are sometimes great successes, sometimes things are put on hold. Conserva uh, excuse me, conservation work is executed with archival materials which are non-damaging to the work. Many of the images and problems that you will see arise from a time when there were no archival materials. In other words, no materials that were stable enough that they themselves didn't deteriorate or cause further damage to the artifact. They didn't exist. And so consequently, a variety of materials have been made in good intentions to fix something or to do something, but the material was inappropriate. Today, with science and the industry of conservation pretty well established, those materials uh, to do the things that you'll see are available. So it's important to have archival materials. And archival doesn't mean somebody saying it's archival in our field. Archival to us means that the science supporting the claim has been done, and we can request what's called a spec sheet showing what was done and the results. Without that, we don't call anything archival even if it says so on the store at Hobby Lobby. Um, probably shouldn't say that. Hobby Lobby will now call me. Um, the techniques used are well-established practices, but new ones are added in the field as it advances. Again, prior to the field of conservation, repairs were done. Many things were learned through centuries of having this material known to work and not work, so we learned. And finally, we recommend preventative measures. Understanding how materials age and how they are affected by the external forces enables a conservator to make recommendations regarding safe practices, as well as assisting in disaster planning and recovery. And we're very much involved with um, institutions, as well as our own studio. We have a disaster plan and a recovery me uh, mechanism because living in Florida, you should have it no matter where you live, but living in Florida, we do tend to have issues. So let's start very briefly with the first phase, assessing the collection. In the last year and a half, I was very lucky to be invited to help the Dali Museum do a collection assessment of its works of, works of art on paper. Um, and it's now been uh, by the staff and Shana and her staff been able to be put in a spreadsheet and documented, and it's important to have a snapshot of where your collection is and knowing what's at risk. Because once you know what's at risk and you can prioritize that, you can start dealing with those artifacts which are most at risk so you don't lose them, and then work your way progressively to those that are relatively stable, but let's get it fixed before it gets worse. So that has been done. So let's talk then about some of the typical types of damage that you will find on works on paper and how to prevent this from happening again. And you will see in these illustrations, we have everything from mold in the top right and middle image, uh, as well as damage from the ways things were stored. On the left side, we have foxing damage that's caused by relative humidity as well as impurities in water. Uh, and on the bottom left, we have what's called photo oxidation or basically damage by light. Inappropriate light exposure, all light, damages paper. It's just a matter of degree and how long before it takes root. UV is the worst light because it uh, damages it faster and more aggressively. UV fades the color of paper, the pigments associated on a piece of paper. Oxidation, this is where Basically think acid, oxidation of primary support. This is discoloration, eventual embrittlement, and it's correctable to a degree, but if left unattended to, it will make paper brittle and crumble. And oxidation is a word derived from the word oxygen in reacting to the environment. Think of those of you who are old enough to remember newspapers and had them long enough, knew that they were once kind of whitish, 
lightish and all very yellowish. That's oxidation. That happens to all papers generally as a result of light. Inappropriate temperature and relative humidity levels can also cause an extreme amount of damage. When environmental controls are not stable uh, and set within a parameter which were established by conservation scientists, or they fluctuate, oh, I'm going to go on vacation, I'll turn off the AC, right? Either of those situations accelerates the natural inherent decomposition of materials. So foxing, the spotting on the top left, is a, uh, is a result of poor environmental conditions. There were other reasons for items being in the paper inherently that sort of blossom when you have poor relative humidity. Mold, obviously you know the nature of mold. It not only discolors it with the stain of the particular mold, but it also weakens those fibers. And those fibers, once they weaken, uh, are no longer able to support the paper and can become fuzzy and sort of like uh, toilet paper, it just falls apart. And then the embrittlement of paper, that fracturing that happens like with newspapers when they just turn into fragments. Another very large um, source of damage over the decades is, of course, mounting practices. And as I mentioned earlier, through no fault, uh, archival materials were not available readily for the last, I would say, 30 years off and on. They were available but not extensively used, primarily because a lot of people didn't know how to use them or the concerns. But damage from mounting, we have a, inherited a long history of various types of materials and methods used to mount or display in your home or in a museum and to store artwork. Many of the adhesives which were encountered have not been archival. And as I said, there are several reasons for this. Archival materials were not previously available. The adhesive industry produced a plethora of tapes and adhesives claiming to be safe without any signs to back it up. In other words, when asked, give us your recipe, give us your studies, nobody responds, right? And only now has enough time elapsed to have that natural aging I refer to reveal the problems with adhesives. The use of non-archival materials or inappropriate techniques cause a variety of damage. First, there's both physical and chemical damage from the adhesive, planar distortion, that means there's cockling in, your, in common speak. There's staining, there's cross-linking of adhesives, and cross-linking mean that the adhesive, which typically sits on the surface and makes an adhesive bond, as it ages, gets into the paper fiber as a chemical reaction and bonds with it, so it becomes much more difficult, not impossible, but much more difficult to separate the adhesive out of the paper. And if you don't remove the adhesive, um, then it will destroy that area where the adhesive tape was. And then physical damage to the primary support from in, uh, inappropriate mounting techniques. These can cause anything from creases to delamination to fractures and tears. So you can see on the top left, uh, in the left image, which seems a little blurry, but maybe that's because I'm looking at a weird angle, there's pressure sensitive tape, and then on top of that, uh, masking tape. On the right, this was glued with rubber cement. And you can see both the staining, that's oxidation, uh, of the paper it was supported to and the artifact. This watercolor was glued to a backing board and then on top of that masking tape. Uh, this calder was folded, so you can see on the right. And then you can see those lines. What do you think it was up against? Cardboard. Right? Those are the very lines you see of the cardboard. And the reason you see that rippling is because the cardboard ripples and the points of contact between the cardboard peak is what stained it. And then the cardboard, the sort of valley of it, didn't make contact. Which, and so it just transfers that acidity. Acidity moves, it just doesn't stay where it is. If you take something that's non-acidic, an archival paper, put it next to acidic item, that archival paper will absorb that acidity because acidity migrates. It has a life of its own. So disaster planning and recovery. I'll just use a little example here to give you both some hope and, and, and encourage you to make sure you're taking care of your collection. Disasters happen. They can be water, they can be fire, and they can just be an accident, a Coke can spilled. 
The range of damage from disasters, as you will know, can vary from total loss to selective damage, depending on the nature of the disaster and that of the material and the media. In Florida, we should be especially prepared for wind and water damage and by having a robust disaster plan and recovery. Some damage is irreversible, as in a fire. Some, in the book below, irreversible were the damages. Some damage can be restored, as the image you'll see in the right. Um, it was in a fire, uh, paper burned, and there's soot and discoloration, but it was able to be restored. And because of the materials or the media, the nature of the damage can be repaired in some cases. Many items that could have been restored were thrown away because they assumed all was lost or were not able to find an experienced conserver willing to take the risk in, in attempting. My theory is if you think it's so lo uh, lost, give it to me and it costs nothing to find out what we can do. So here's an illustration in that same fire, this was in Santa Fe, this actually, this piece my husband worked on, this was from the 80s, uh, early 80s, when the field was just starting. Uh, the painting uh, was a watercolor, was damaged in the fire, you can see that on the top left. The watercolor on the paper was mounted onto a cardboard. The fire burnt off the top section of the paper and scorched the rest. You can see a detail on the top right. While the color and the paper burned off, surface cleaning allowed the conservator to see the shadow of the figures that were once there. The two layers were separated, washed, stains reduced. While colors were affected by both the fire and the wash, the artist's work was able to survive and the shadow figures tell their story. So you'll see in the bottom left, those are the figures that remained those, those are not painted in. Obviously, you have the watercolor and a change in tonality, which could, I mean, we could have painted right over it, but it was best to sort of leave the scar of the tonality of the watercolors at what they were. But that those blackened shadows are actually what remained on the cardboard. And the reason is, if you recall the horrible stories of Nagasaki and Hiroshima, when there's a fire that's so intense, and this is also true in Pompeii, so intense, and you're standing in the line of fire, that scorch transfers to the wall behind you. And you've probably seen some of those horrific images capturing the outline of the figure. That's exactly what happened here, this scorch shadowing of a very intense fire. So it at least allowed the conservator to relay the story, not only of the artistic, artist's intent, but what this particular piece had gone through, it has now a life of its own. Not many curators or conservators would have bothered with this. From the curator's perspective, there was nothing more to lose. But from the conservator's pr perspective, especially a, an experienced conserver, it was an opportunity to push the boundaries of what was. The risk taking is how a conservator grows and how the field benefits. So it is important sometimes to know what kind of risks you're taking and for what, because you can in the process discover things that can help you later on. So I, I put that in there, but it should happen with someone who is a, a trained conservator, not someone who wants to basically just experience their own limits. So paper conservators world is about conservation treatment. Paper conservator deals with a wide range of artifacts representing different primary supports, different structures, substrates, and different media in various formats. Typical supports are paper and parchment that a paper conservator would deal with, but also materials used to make paper are different. They can be cotton, they can be linen fibers, they can be wood fibers, or they can be straw, just to mention a few. In addition to these pulped fibers, and I make that distinction because that's the definition of paper, they're pulped fibers to make a paper. But in addition to pulped fibers, the paper conservator may work on other primary supports, such as pith, which is the core of a particular type of tree that you find in Asia, birch bark, which has been used throughout North America as well as Europe, silk screens, which are a combination of fabric plus paper, and palm leaves. These are, think of your palm fronds, but this was the substrate that was most available in uh, 
Asia and uh, tropical areas for them to record information. You have to remember what we use as substrate is so much defined by the material resources of any particular area that that's what was used to record information or to create art. In addition to the primary support, the conservator also works with various me media used by artists, such as inks, paints, chalk, pastel, charcoal, pencil, etc., and various tech news, uh, techniques used by artists, such as drawing and etching, wood blocks, engravings, lithographs, silk screens, and digital printing now. Like that wasn't enough already before. Um, because of the scope of the materials and the techniques used, the paper conservator requires a wider breadth of knowledge, skill, and experience that, than other conservation disciplines. This is not to say that skill and experience is not uh, uh, a, uh, a uh, venue for other conservators. That's not what I'm saying. All I'm saying, so I don't offend my other conservators and other fields, uh, all I'm saying is that there's so much more diversity that has happened in the field of paper artifacts that it is taxing, and we haven't even gotten to modern art yet, right? All right, so here are just some images of a variety of problems of a variety of materials. So we have regular kind of paper, manuscripts, insect damage. We have beautiful uh, uh, herbarium that was put inside a binder with sleeves and it stuck to the sleeves. We have mold, we have water staining on the center left. We have birch bark in the center there. We have pith, we don't call it paper, although many people do, it's not paper because it's not pulped, um, in the middle right of that dove looking. Uh, we have scrapbooks, that's bad enough, and then we have newspapers already brittle glued to scrapbooks. Then we have Japanese prints to the right, a large collection that we had at Hopkins that were uh, front and back glued and then uh, overlapped to make like an accordion book, so there was that. Another herbarium on the bottom left, blueprints, got to deal with that, that's a whole other story, and maps that oftentimes get adhered to canvas. So the breadth of the complexities is compounded by all these things that are done to them. I want to talk about just a couple of what's called inherent problems with historic materials, and then I'll get to modern materials, just so you can see the distinction of how a conservator in book and paper has to work. So conservation treatments for historic works on paper, we will call historic pre-industrial revolution, right? Uh, are generally more straightforward than with modern and contemporary works on paper. And there are several reasons for this. When artists and tradesmen and merchants started to use paper instead of parchment, for their primary support, this is around the late 14th century, they did so in the context of an already established tradition of colorists and ink makers. It wasn't like paper and then nothing before, right? So they used those materials on this new substrate. They already had experience with pigments and colors. This new material, which would become the format then for printing, would then also develop wood blocks. Well, wood blocks predate print printing in the press, but the new material, wood blocks, engravings, etchings, developed again within the context of an established trade and guilds, which had rules, which had tradition that was passed on. Um, so materials are very well developed and known. Artisans learned what worked, what didn't work, and they passed this down from master to apprentice for hundreds of years. That was the nature of us, our signs of the past, experiential signs. As a result, the conservator today has a wealth of knowledge of historical materials, media, and techniques. Paper conservators have been dealing with paper repairs and damage for centuries, even if the techniques have changed over time. That is not the case when working with mixed media and modern works of art, which are newer, haven't had the test of time to, nat to age naturally. But beyond the physical damage, uh, paper can sustain. There are some inherent uh, issues with paper, uh, inherent to older paper. And this is the problem of iron gall ink, which was a recipe that was used for writing since antiquity till about the early 20th century, and verdigris, which is the color green, which is made from copper. The damage that you see here, 
Iron Gall ink on the right, corrodes and then eats through paper. You can see the same damage below. This was a gradual, a religious text where the music notation and some of the writing has the paper, it's eaten straight through the paper. Wherever there's a heavy deposit of iron gall ink, it corrodes because it's made out of iron. Conversely, verdigris, which was copper used to make the pigment green, was extensively used in illustrations, as in the right, and in map making. That thing that, that map in the middle that looks like yellow was originally green, representing a land mass. So while copper is no longer used to make the green pigment, the production of verdigris continued through, excuse me, through the 20th century, and many maps and art on paper with green pigment continue to deteriorate in our museums and special collections today. Copper, like iron, and some other what's called transitional metals, these metals that have these uh, ions that like to, uh, outer shell ions that like to constantly move around, continue to produ uh, produce complex reactions on materials. This is still a problem today, and as it turns out, um, just to share with you, and in October of this year, another um, organization like AIC, but it's called YADA, but spelt I-A-D-A, -A. it's an acronym uh, for German, I'm not gonna even dare to pronounce it. My husband, if he's watching this, will be insulted. Uh, he's, he speaks German fluently. <laughs> he was trained in Germany. Um, but they're having a conference, and the topic of iron gall ink and verdigris is still unresolved. Experiments have happened. We've tried a number of techniques. Sometimes they work. We're not as happy. We're continuing to research. And even though these works were from the 1700s and earlier, they continue to degrade. So we do need a solution. We don't quite have one yet. Some common damage to works on paper then. Let's look at some of the damage caused from external forces. Foxing. This is caused by metal contaminants in paper during the process of making paper. It can also be caused by mold. And the damage appears as this measles, this spotting in the primary support, which is accelerated when the environment is inappropriate. So you can see the foxing in the full document. There's a close up there. And then after conservation, the foxing was removed. And it can be removed. Here's a piece of a dolly piece which had uh, foxing, other forms of oxidation, that overall discoloration is um, from uh, acidity, and then the spottiness is from foxing. Both of them were able to be resolved, fortunately. Another Dolly example. Now, this is an interesting one. So we talked about foxing due to acidity. This foxing, or excuse me, this discoloration if you look at the first image on the left, you see a sort of outline on the perimeter and kind of wider in the middle. This is an image, uh, this is a substrate which had an image on both the front and the back. And this was not iron gall ink, it's black carbon ink, um, very stable. This is what's called mat burn. This is when you have a window mat, when you go to display something or frame it in your home, that's not archival, it has acidity. And it transferred that acidity to the paper. And the backing board that usually comes with a mat was also acidic because on the back side, which is the second image, is also discolored. Again, soluble acidity, acidity um, staining from acidity, which is soluble, can be washed out. In here, we have a different, the opposite problem. The discoloration here is due to photooxidation, or in other words, light damage, over light exposure, or overly high light exposure. The paper exposed to two, uh, the, I have two too many's, too much light, overextended period of time, degrades the cellulose and penetrates through the fiber. So if you look at the close up on the bottom, you see where there's a little white perimeter. If this were matte burn, the discoloration would be like the one before. The perimeter would be stained and the main image would be lighter. But here it's the opposite. The mat in this case was archival, protecting the perimeter, but it was exposed to too much light. So it oxidized because of light. <coughs> and then here's the result on the right after treatment. So this is the, if you look at the bottom left, this is washing something with soluble acid. Look how much discoloration comes out. That's what's contained 
in that paper. And if it's soluble, you can wash it out. So some discoloration is a sign of acidity in the paper. If untreated, it will continue to break down the paper fibers and along with it, the damage to the artist's message, right? Soluble acids in paper can be reduced by washing in pH neutral recalcified water, keeping the pH level and giving it a little bit more calcium in there. Depending on the degree of acidity, different solvents may be needed if it's beyond solubility. Another example from the Dali collection, this is of Kadakes, severe staining from acidity not only has obscured the artist's drawing, but the level of oxidation has also accelerated the degradation of the painting. When the staining is so severe, remedial action is needed to further uh, prevent deterioration. Washing and stain reduction, in this case using other solvents, can reverse the effects and then neutralizing it or deacidifying it, a lot, giving it basically like Tums Milk of Magnesia, a, a treatment so that the reaction with the atmosphere can be slower. This can further protect the work from acids. However, if preventative measures are not followed and the work is again subject to poor environment or acidic materials, the cycle of oxidation damage will continue. So there it is afterwards. And you can still see a little bit staining in the back of the, of the piece, but it's a lot better. And this is where you stop at a certain point to know that doing anything more may have caused risk to the paper fibers because it is possible to weaken paper through too much treatment. Another example of the same of oxidation. Interestingly, in this piece, the top right corner of the work was matted and displayed. They didn't want to show the rest of the work, just that one piece. We see the outline of the mat board and the result of off-gassing of acidity from the rest of the mat to the rest of the work. So you can see the outline where the matte edge was and then the rest. There's also obviously staining on the bottom from adhesive uh, and staining on the top left corner from adhesive. Um, and then you can see the result afterwards on the right. So I'm gonna give you something different just because you know different is good. Uh, the effects of light exposure now on pigments. So we've talked about light exposure on the primary support. Now we're going to talk about it on pigments. I'm trying to watch my time. I'm going to have to go faster. Um, this is a French wallpaper, a fragment that was in a historic home at Hopkins. Um, but uh, sometime later on, uh, a border was added and it was framed for display. The curator wanted to, uh, for me to take the border off to expose the original wallpaper in its entirety so that we could get a the full pattern. She wanted to reproduce it uh, and put it in the room for which it was intended. In order to understand this particular wallpaper and the materials, I had to do a little research and I contacted um, the Musée des Peintiers. Look at that, my PowerPoint just has some weird words in there. On the critique there, I don't know where that came from. Um, so um, I contacted the French Museum and also read a reference source on this particular style of arabesque and discovered that it was manufactured and designed by Jean-Baptiste Revion. His factory was the first factory to have the first riot during the French Revolution and is known as the Revion Riots. So it was a piece of interesting history. We always find history. That's one of the joys of it. In this case, the wallpaper once we removed the border, showed that the original ground color was blue, not the grayish tone. And that's for several reasons. The blue that was used, that we had to do a little research, was a Prussian blue made from what's called a distemper paint, which is basically a water-based paint, which is soluble in water. Um, we could not reverse it back to what it was, but it did give us an idea of two things, which is what was the color of the wallpaper originally, and then how Prussian blue oxidizes in contact with the air and turns, and light, excuse me, and turns this grayish color. Um, you have to remember, rooms in those days did not have as much light as we have now, so it would have been a brilliant blue with these brilliant colors of the pattern, but c'est la vie, right? Um, and then there was a water stain uh, on it to boot. And I knew I couldn't use a water-based way of 
retouching it, couldn't flush out the st water stain because it stains with water. So I had to mask it, I had to in paint. And once I understood how the materi what materials were used, I had to find a binder instead of water to mix with the pigment. And I found a we have a modern binder, it's called Clucel G, mix it with ethanol, and it allowed me to in paint in the areas of damage so I could mask it. And that's what's on the right. So it looks not bad. Here we have a dolly piece, uh, which, and this is on the topic of pigmented color, uh, pigmented primary supports. You can see on the top left the yellow discoloration, again, due to light exposure. Uh, and then on the left side, it was out of a sketchbook, and you can see the perforations of the spiral binder uh, where the mat had covered the sprockets there and a little bit on the bottom and on the right, uh, not as easily, but that's why I accentuated that, that it was originally a blue tinted paper. We did our traditional washing treatment, got the oxidation off, but of course we cannot return the blue tinted uh, tint to the paper. It's not possible because once it's gone, it's gone. Uh, but again, it shows you what that must have looked like with a blue background rather than a white background. And on that same topic, same a different piece with the same problem, except that here the pigments used were gouache. This is a form of watercolor that's soluble in water. So washing wasn't gonna work. Um, and it has foxing, see the little blemishes on the bottom right from that little corner. So it was overall discolored and it had foxing. The only way, and the foxing was extensive, to remove the foxing without using water was to do what's called localized reduction. We use uh, a diluted form of hydrogen peroxide and dot by dot by dot, all the foxing was removed and then averaged out. And you can see on the back, besides it having tape, there was a blue tint to it. So I knew when I looked at the front and the back that the back looked different. And I said, why does the, black have a, the back have a blue tint? But I couldn't see the tint on the front because of the way it was matted. When the mat was removed, you can see again on the bottom right that slight blue tint. And again, I knew I was dealing with the tinted paper. After, before the discoloration and the foxing and then the, the clarity of color on the right, still not the original blue. So we decided to do a little experiment, digitally alterating the finished product this way. So on the far left is how the damage looked. In the middle is after conservation. On the right, we I simply took that image and in Photoshop put the exact tone that would have been in. That's what Dolly produced. That's what damage prevents us from seeing. That's why light damage is such a difficult uh, thing to control. Damage from poor repair. So I've already talked generally about all these kinds of adhesives that uh, get placed onto materials, primary supports, either to fix it or to mount it, that have been the bane of our existence. Um, some of it is rubber cement, some of it, it's just a mess. So when the, it, the carrier that holds the adhesive dries out, as in the case of the top left image and the middle image, it stains. You can pull off that adhesive, uh, the carrier, excuse me, but the adhesive and the staining remain embedded. So I thought I'd give you a different example of something that I dealt with that is, again, um, sometimes comes into the realm of paper conservation. This was what's called a rigid fan, they predate folded fans in China, beautifully painted on silk. It had tape, I'm sorry for that image in the middle, I, uh, my lights uh, that day were not working well in the studio. Um, and it was scotch taped on the back. And all the fractures were basically, as you can see on the right, held together by the tape. So I had to take the tape, I took the tape off, then the fractures fell apart, took it out of the frame. Uh, and you can see it basically holding it together and the staining. So top left is with the carrier on it, bottom left carrier removed, top right, that's the staining from the adhesive, right? That's the damage on the front. And you can see that it's uh, textile rather than paper because you can see generally the weave of the fabric. So what was the first thing to do starting from the back? The pigments were stable in water because it was old. Watercolor over a certain length of time are stable in water. 
you don't want to like be throwing water all over it, but generally if a little water touches it, it's not a problem. So taking off the tape in this case and then reducing the staining. In that second slide, you see a little pipette and we have a little suction platen that when you put the solvent through the pipette, pulls the stain through the paper into suction and, and releases it into the containers so it doesn't feather out. So the staining was reduced. Oops, sorry. The staining was reduced. Uh, the, pe the piece was sort of put back together. And then there's a material called gossamer tissue, which is a super, super fine uh, tissue that when you throw it up in the air, you can see it just floats. Because I didn't want to mask the back of the, uh, the silk, I wanted to be able to see the slight pattern. I used that and then provided a secondary support to the back. Then came the work of trying to fix the front. And with all the fractures, I reinforced things with Japanese paper and then proceeded to put back the colors where they belonged uh, with a uh, Chinese pigment uh, pigments that you can still get. And then I built a proper box for it. It would have just been put in a plastic bag. Um, and uh, the lady wanted to give it to her uh, daughter or granddaughter. And then I made a customized enclosure. Those little ribbons you see, in order to not touch the thing, you just pull and the item pops out. So we're going to go back to a dolly piece. So more staying problems. So again, I'm not going to read everything because I'm, I'm trying to be mindful of my time, which is slowly coming to an end. Um, the staining on the top right, you probably already know, the yellow sort of squares, rectangles, are from photo oxidation, too much light. The rest of the cardboard, which it, uh, Dolly had used ink and a gouache on, was unaffected by light because the window mat covered it, so it was protected. But it was cardboard. Now we have a different problem. Now we're getting into a little bit of modern material, not drastic. But because it's on cardboard, it's thick. So I couldn't use solvents to get through it. Because it's ink and gouache, it's water sensitive, so I couldn't use water. So on the front side, I couldn't do anything yet. On the back side, I was able to remove the tape. I was able to reduce. So the bottom piece that you're seeing is the back of the cardboard. He also had an ink drawing there where the hinges are. You can see they were removed. The cardboard, the stain there was basically physically manually sanded off. I don't have afters of this. But the issue here is that a water solution would not have helped even if the pigments were uh, not water soluble because of the thickness. And if I put the whole cardboard into water, it would sort of start to unravel. Not necessarily, sometimes it can work, but it was risk I was not willing to take. Uh, there are techniques that are being developed uh, for the use of what's called gels in a rigid structure. Think of jello of, and embedding it with solvents and then putting it like a compress. But the solvents that we need to get rid of that staining haven't worked with the gel structure yet, and that too is still being explored. Here we have an etching uh, by Whistler with foxing, light damage, and residual rubber cement on the back, you can see. Again, traditional methods of stain reduction were successful in this, but a modest haloing still exists on the back. Doing anything more would have been risky. This was a good place to stop. Here's a dolly piece, uh, charcoal glued to cardboard. You can see in the third image. I wanted to separate the cardboard from the charcoal. Couldn't work from the front because charcoal is friable. So I worked from the back and basically peeled away the cardboard. This was a dry mount technique, something you'll see in framers shops still today. Once that cardboard was eliminated, we now get a whole bunch of information. So on the top right, we get to see the watermark of the paper. That gives us information about the paper that Dolly used. On the bottom, there's an inscription. I didn't read it, but your cur curators can read it. Maybe it's Dolly's, maybe it's the person who bought it, maybe it was the auction house, don't know. Would have to trace provenance here. But more importantly, from my point, these little splotchiness, this is where the knots of a tree, which have the most lignin, seeped into the paper. And what does that tell us? It tells us that da Dolly, when he made this sketch, most likely had it up against a piece of wood long enough that the lignin stained the paper. 
So here's one of the most important pieces of Dolly's work that we have here, the study for the soft watch. Speaking of cardboards again, on the top left is how the, the item came to me. Severe staining on the front, very much obscuring the image, and glued to a velvet frame of some sort. I don't remember now. It was velvet on the back, velvet around it. Uh, but it's a cardboard made from straw, not from, uh, paper, uh, not from uh, cotton, linen, or wood. Again, issues of penetration of washing were compromised. I couldn't get through it. So with a discussion with Shana and the curators, uh, I said the risk was worth taking to delaminate it. In other words, to thin out that cardboard, since there was nothing on the back other than that red velvet, to try to get the, uh, the washing bath to reduce the staining. And then I would resupport it on the back with a Japanese tissue. And that's what happened. So we were able to reduce the staining. I think it's a vastly improved. And we're able to stabilize it with the support on the back. Mixed media. I'm shamefully going to run quickly. So this is a piece uh, of material which includes an etched glass on the back, this drawing on the front, and then two layers of blue vinyl, uh, transparent kind of vinyl fabric, uh, not fabric, uh, material in between the sandwich. And it was intended to make the etching on the glass more visible. And then it was taped across the top and the back First, the glass with the blue, oops, sorry, the glass with the blue and then the piece could not take it apart uh, without risking damage to the image because the tape on the top had the continuation of his hairline. Um, so I was able to take it off from the bottom, separate it, straighten out one of the vinyl pieces, and then put it back together. But the point of all of this is that mixed media and contemporary art um, present much greater challenges because of these composite materials that artists who are inventive, creative, uh, are pulling together. As a result, cons conservation treatment may not be straightforward. And sometimes a uh, conservator is challenged in identifying what was intended from what is damaged. And for this reason, we often work with curators who are connoisseurs of that particular artist. I'll give you this uh, example, not a Dolly piece. This is an Irving Harper uh, sculpted paper. Um, it was in his personal uh, possession in his home until he died and it was auctioned off. And it's a series of cards uh, that are folded, cut, glued. Um, it was, they were the reception cards, the invitation cards for the opening of a reception he gave uh, of his exhibition in 1978 in New York. And they were all just Elmer's glued onto wood. Um, and you can see some of the spikes have fallen. There's insects, there's dust. The case, the window box in which it was enclosed failed. Um, and so consequently, all this damage happened. So I had to make a decision. I didn't want to take the whole thing apart, obviously. Um, we were able to surface clean it with a brush and with some air compressors. I was able to re-glue the spikes where they went. I went through everything looking for missing spikes. Uh, and areas where things were crushed, sort of like that one on the right, was able to reinforce and leave. But you can see there's mold. There's no way to individually treat each of those folded cards without taking the whole thing apart. So the whole thing was disinfected but as a unilateral, after it got surface cleaned and the pieces glued back together, it was disinfected. And that's all we could do and then put it back in the case. Another mixed media now from Dolly. So this was an interesting piece. It was not described, it was described, uh, I think at the time, as uh, watercolor or gouache, I can't recall. But what it is, is transparent paper. You know, that kind you can see through um, and that a lot of architectural drawings are also done on. Uh, in this case, he uh, took the transparent paper, embedded it into a, a very thick cardboard like that, glued it in. You can see the cutout in the cardboard, varnished it, and then incised it. And he incised it with some sort of stylus, because when you look at it close from raking like, you can see the, the, the relative cuts. And then he painted, and then he varnished again. 
The problem is you can see from the matting, it has uh, oxidized from light exposure, gone browner, brownish red in this case, uh, and I could not separate it because typically transparent paper is very fragile and I couldn't lift it to treat it. So uh, nothing was done other than to neutralize the acids on it because it would have been, there was no way that I wouldn't have compromised the etching. Finally, the last big transparent paper. So this came to the studio. This was an oversized piece on transparent paper, 52 inches by 67, would not fit in the sink. It was glued onto paper, and that was glued onto a very thick cardboard. And you can see there's discoloration. On the far right, the discoloration there is due to something different. That right section is an added piece. The, the oversized is everything from the left up into that big stained area, and then Dolly or whomever uh, fabricated this put pieces together for that extension because the paper wasn't big enough. Um, and of course, historic papers, we don't have this size because they couldn't produce things uh, on a roll. They were a, there was no roll paper for a long time. And even the wallpaper that you saw early, which was 17th century, is composed of individual pieces of laid paper that, that simply got, over, they got printed and they got overlapped. So it was easy to manually handle conservation for even historic wallpapers because they weren't one piece. This is all one piece. So had to remove it from the board. You can see the cardboard below it, and you can also see the piecing there. Sometimes they didn't match. Removed it from the cardboard, and on the left here, you can see that white sort of line that goes down through the dark. That's the color the paper, the transparent paper would have been. But because of oxidation and contact with an acidic back, this area, which was not well glued down, stayed relatively white. But these creases are also a result that um, when there is an air bubble or a line, the staining of the varnish and the staining uh, can't go there because air has been introduced there. So. So you can see that it was white before because that's where the varnish isn't. So I marked the section on the right, which were in fragments, so I, I knew which order to put them back in. I did a test sample on a small fragment to see how to, the, what would happen in a wash. The cardboard came out, and it got a little lighter. And I was happy with that tonality. It wasn't supposed to be white, white, right? Um, after the test, then I did the whole thing. And you can see on the right, it's been pieced together and gaps were filled by Japanese paper, toned similarly to the overall color. And again, on the left, you can see the smaller pieces, the pieces that I could manage to wash. Uh, on the left, in water, you can see the one with uh, cardboard or paper liner still attached to it and the yellow discoloration. And then I had just finished the one on the bottom, but then I put it back in the sink for the photo op. Um, and then on the right side, which is where the oversize is, that's on my workbench in the studio. And we basically supported all corners. And I went section at a time cleaning it. So you can see on the bottom right, uh, half of that image or a third of that image on the right, how much cleaner that is. That's the wash. And all that discoloration you see is not paper. That's acid, soluble acid being pushed out. And then I wipe it off and then start again. And then the top middle section, you can see I have a little bit still left in the middle. Um, then once it was all cleaned, it was drummed, lined, and drummed on the, on the counter so it couldn't uh, move because we don't want it to expand and contract, which this paper didn't. It didn't have a large um, expansion uh, dis uh, distortion ratio, so we were really pleased about that. And so just to see before, middle, and after, that's what it looked like when it came. You can see the staining greater on the right. That's the back board. And what you're seeing there in those lines is the acidity of the board and the light damage to the piece, which where the black lines were prevented the light from hitting it and so transferred, right, the acidity around it, but not where it was protected by the black graphic lines. And then the right is afterwards. So to close, 
a little bit over time, my apologies, the whole Dali experience, right? So I spent six weeks in Spain at the beginning of this year. I was very happy. It was right after the last Dali project I did. I said, I need to, I need to go away. So where do I go to Spain, right, where Dali is? <laughs> um, besides traveling across the country, which I love, I made my pilgrimage to Figueres and to the Dali Theater Museum. And I had a delightful experience to see uh, even though for a brief time, Dali's artistic expression, his craftsmanship, his eccentricism gave me a new appreciation of him as an artist. I saw many works on paper now using very familiar techniques and methods that I encountered here. And this affords me as a conservator to develop a sort of connoisseurship with respect to the artist. In addition to the Dali uh, Museum, I went down the treacherous drive to Cadiz. I will happily go back to the Dali Museum. I am not going to go down that road again, because I do not want to have a heart attack. Uh, that was one of the calmer sides of the road. It was excruciatingly scary. So anyway, that's what I have to say. So I'm told I'm allowed to entertain questions. Is that right? Okay, I'm going to take a drink. Yes. Well, first of all, I'm sh well, I want to thank you for what you've done for this collection. It's just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. what you're, what you're doing. Well, I thank you for the opportunity. And, well, and also, what a great presentation it was. I'm surprised you said you almost got a heart attack from the drive, because I would think every day you do your work, yeah. <laughs> there's an emotional risk associated with that. So I, I want to make it work. There are moments. <laughs> Two quick questions. Yes. I noticed that there wasn't anything about parchment that's not included, so I was curious why, sure. why parchment's not included. And my second question is, so after you do your work, and I want to talk about the Dali pieces, but I expect you to stay here for the rest of your life. Uh, after you do your work on pieces, how does that change the value of any piece? Of oh, both good questions. Well, I didn't put parchment down because there's just so much time. I could have done a whole lot more. Parchment is really interesting. So it, it I. Yes, oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. And parchment and leather. I mean, I've worked on, um, I was in uh, Egypt on a consultancy uh, at what's called the Dar Khatub Library, which is where the Mamluk Qurans and, are. And I've worked on parchment extensively. But I only had 45 minutes. I wanted to make it relevant. And there were no parchment documents that came into my treatment. But yes, I work that manuscript that you, well, that one was paper. Yeah. So there are lots of things. I didn't do the birch bark and I did a little bit of the wallpaper. I tried to stay on, on topic of paper. So the, so that's, that's why. And then the second one is about value. So value, you're speaking specifically about monetary value. I, I think I look at the uh, at artifacts two ways. One is cultural value or historic value, whatever other term you want to apply, and then monetary value. I can certainly tell you that something damaged will sell for less than something not damaged, right? You can just go to the auction houses and see that. Many of our clients, understanding that principle, uh, and many of the auction houses we work with, too, uh, so collectors uh, that we have, uh, big collectors and auction houses, will buy intentionally damaged materials for far less money, send it to us, and we fix it, and then they flip it for far more money. So I, I think um, if you think of market, it's just sort of like home. You buy a house, you, you fix it, you flip it. Um, is it the same as when it first came out? No, because it's been repaired and all that is documented. There's no delusion about that. Um, if uh, at least we do our part, I will say that there have been places that we work with some dealers who've resold it and have not revealed that information that we know happens. But from our ethical perspective, we document everything that was done. And yes, there's there's money, you don't devalue. People, you know, I find a, a lot of times people who are dealers will tell you that so they can buy it for less, so they can flip it for more. Okay, YouTube, all those dealers listening to me. You know, some of you are great guys and gals. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Well, you brought up cultural value, so I'm curious about what your thoughts are on that. Well, cultural value, it's either fix it or lose it. <laughs> You know, I don't know what kind of more value there is. I mean, we don't, I mean, when you think of all the other cultural artifacts, uh, objects from 
Greco-Roman time or paintings. Painting con conservation happens every day. Nobody questions is there value in fixing a uh, Delacroix or a Vasquez. If you don't fix it, you don't have it. You have to remember the value in a work of art is the aesthetics. If you can't keep the aesthetics alive, there is no value for just a piece of paper. It's the image, it's the message. Once that's lost, there's no aesthetic value of anything, right? So the, the aesthetics is what we're reconstructing when we have to, because that is the message. Yes? Thank you so much for your presentation. I'm um, curious if the advances that you and your industry have done in 30 years might have an impact on contemporary artists today mm -hmm. who might be more aware. I don't know if you think a few of them do, or it might be you know, who use different materials, do use different right. techniques. Well, I mean, let me answer factually, and then let me answer from my subjective perspective. Factually, there are archival materials available to all artists that never, those things weren't around. I mean, older material was archival because by the nature of the material, it was natural, it was organic, we know it. It's all the synthetic stuff that is typically made or cheap. Uh, you know, they make pigments lighter so they don't last longer as opposed to quality pigments. You can just go on any on lights, online um, art supply site and say, you know, uh, you'll see symbols tested, you know, approved, professional grade, amateur grade, student grade. That's a statement about quality, not about the skill of the person, right? I mean, that's whichever, it's about the quality of the material. When you have so much ability, then it becomes a matter of affordability. So the materials are there. If the artist uh, has the money, they buy quality materials. And many of the art from prior to industrialization was quality material because not so many people did it, so it was made specifically with artists in mind. Now there's such a commercialization of materials you know, for the hobbyist, the kid at school, the professional, that you have to be attentive to what you're buying. I mean, you're not gonna pay $20 for a tube of high quality watercolor for your kid, or maybe you would. I mean, that's fine too. It's not an ethical issue, it's a financial issue. So artists can't do have access to it. Whether or not they can afford it is a different issue. So that's the fact about it. Um, does our work inform artists? I have taught many courses. I was an adjunct at several art uh, universities when I was employed full-time by an institution, um, lecturing on artist quality materials. This is not a new topic, but it's affordability. On the subjective side, I think artists will do whatever they feel like because that's the nature of being an artist, you know? I see that and I go, oh, that's interesting. What can I do with it? Right? They're inventive. They think differently than, um, that's not to say they can't be analytical, obviously, that's, you know, but artists have the virtue and the freedom to do what they want because that's the nature of their being, right? I'm not an artist, I'm a conservator. My nature is to want to do things right, <laughs> right? Yes, sir. What is the most challenging project you've ever had? Oh, I knew you were going to ask. Somebody was going to ask. <laughs> you know, I. Uh, there's so many ways in which the scariest. I have to think about that. Let me get back to you. I don't. Uh, yeah, I have to think about that. I think there are a lot. I mean, I when you ask me that question, emotions come up. And I remember being scared at times, going, oh, do I take this risk? But I can't put my finger on which one. So there, there are times, yes, don't, don't get me wrong. There are moments where, oh, the curse words come out. Yes. I, on all the slides with bare hands, uh, why don't you use gloves? Oh, never. How am I supposed to feel and know what I'm looking at? Yeah, no, the tactile experience, when you're working with things with your hands, you want, I mean, do you ever see a cook wear gloves? Not a real cook, right? Um, you need to feel when um, I'm working on, I'm just finished an Andy Warhol piece that I was telling John earlier that had been dry mounted onto foam board. Oh mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so first you have to take off the foam board, which is glued, so I had to slice it, I had to delaminate it halfway in order to get as close as I could from the backside. Then in order to remove what's called the residual adhesive from the dry mount, you can barely see it. It just looks like a little tint of yellow. You have to look at a side. 
I had to, with my hands, I would dampen it, and then with my hands, I swear I have no longer fingerprints, roll the adhesive. I couldn't feel that with a glove, right? There's no way. Uh, some of these things have texture, right? Uh, when you're working in a sink and you, you're re in water and you're lifting a carrier or a Japanese tissue from a hinge and there's residual adhesive, you have to feel it because it's slimy. You have to work it out so it moves. So that's why, and even if they invented gloves that you could still feel, which I don't know how they would do that, um, they would get in your way. You know, so many more accidents happen with gloves on them than with your bare hands. The best thing to do is wash your hands with soapy water, dry them off really well with the towel, and handle the piece gently, and develop tactile senses, right? Yes? Um, we got a little bit of your biography at the introduction, but I'm very curious as to your personal journey, how you even got to <laughs> considering being a conservative. Oh, long journey. not as direct as some of the interns and fellows that I've had the pleasure of working with. Uh, I, you know, I was one of those, you know, I want to do it all kind of kids, right? I love school. I love learning. I could be in school the rest of my life and be completely content. Um, and I always wanted to work in museums. And at first I thought about a curatorship, but I have such a need to keep my hands busy. So I did go on, my master's was in philosophy, but primarily focused on medieval things, so I dealt with a lot of manuscripts and uh, older material, and I loved just the tactile experience. And then I decided, well, what can I do within the institution that's kind of working with these materials? And then I, dis then I discovered uh, in my early 30s um, this whole field of conservation. And I will say I was really very fortunate to get into the field just as it was starting. One thing that people often don't know or we don't talk about, the American Institute for Conservation has been around for at least 80 years. But it wasn't until 1980 that the field, the subspecialty of book and paper entered into the realm of conservation. And that is primarily because most conservation had been done in museums where there were artifacts and paintings and sculptures and ceramics and a whole uh, icons. That's where conservation really sort of grew in this country, not so much in Europe, but in this country. And it wasn't until the uh, 60s with the whole Florence flood uh, when the library was damaged and the books and that whole thing happened. Um, and also in brittle paper started to age. You know, br brittle paper is the result of converting paper production. This is a long way of answering your question. I know, I apologize. Uh, brittle paper is the result of changing from linen and uh, cotton uh, natural fibers in the making of paper to ground wood pulp. And what happens with that pulp is it oxidizes, it reacts, it's the newspaper phenomenon. It took, so that's happening around 1920s, 1910s. By the time 1950s comes along, late 40s and 50s, libraries throughout the world, and in the US in particular, were saying, oh my god, we're losing our collection. They're just flaking. There's a great uh, thing you can find, I'm sure, on YouTube called Slow Fires. It's the documentation of this paper just disintegrate. That's what all this is destined for if we don't fix it, right? Um, so um, that, inst that problem started to be articulated within libraries, and then it took that 30 years for the American Institute of Conservation to recognize the discipline of book and paper. Prior to that, what libraries would do is, you know, they put it in a box uh, or they'd get rid of it because it's so damaged, what's the good? So anyway, uh, to answer your question, um, I liked artifacts. The library scene was just developing book and paper conservation. And I was dealing with medieval manuscripts and what, and I thought, this is it. This is where I'm going to go. So that's how I ended up there. Bibliophile. Yes, ma'am. Great question, great question. Um, not too many, right? And obviously it depends on what you're doing. Two answers. The quality of the material will not degrade. Given two items, one of it's like the paint image, one good quality paper from, you know, the Renaissance, the Middle Ages, the versus today's paper, that older paper will last longer than modern day paper. That's just because of the material it's made from. So that's number one. I can do more things 
with quality rag paper than I can with modern paper. But even so, depending on what treatment you're doing, washing isn't going to have negative effects. Um, stain reduction is a little bit aggressive. If it washes out with water, you're fine, because paper was born in water, right? It's pulped. Um, washing in stain reduction using harsher solvents to flush out, and usually it doesn't even take a long time, two minutes in a bath, and you're, you're done with it, right? But you can't do that forever. You know, because the fibers will slowly weaken. And if a thing is allowed to get worse before you do something, it's harder to do the treatment without the risk of the fibers tearing apart. That's why it's better to catch problems earlier rather than later, because you're forced later, if there is anything that can be done, to be more aggressive. And I think I say in one of the slides, you know, once you get it fixed, once these things are fixed, the preventative measures have to kick in. You have to control light. You have to control relative humidity. If you don't, I guarantee you, you will be revisiting the very problem that you already wanted to fix. I guarantee you. Those, that's, the environment is the, the worst, I mean, short of a fire, which you can't control. The environment you do have control over right? I sound like I'm on a mission. <laughs> I am. <laughs> I still haven't found an answer. Sorry. 